Hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, at, uh, as uh, it has uh, already been indicated, my name is uh, Norbert Slenzok, and I'm going uh, to be a moderator uh, of the next uh, panel, uh, the first uh, panel uh, session during uh, our uh, conference, uh, entitled uh, Ludwig von Mises uh, and Ethics. The last book written uh, by uh, Ludwig von Mises the ultimate foundation of uh, economic science, begins uh, with uh, the following uh, statement. This essay is not a contribution to philosophy. However, as we all know, in uh, Mises' writings, uh, there are plenty of uh, interesting uh, philosophical insights. However, as uh, we also uh, all know, most of them, or at least uh, the most uh, profound, most uh, influential uh, of them, deal uh, with uh, the problems of uh, epistemology and uh, the methodology uh, of uh, social sciences, of course, with uh, special regard uh, to uh, economics. Uh, that said, uh, we uh, must uh, remember that uh, Mises uh, was uh, not uh, only uh, an academic, not uh, only a pure theorist, uh, but also uh, an ardent uh, advocate of uh, classical liberalism and uh, laissez-faire free market. Uh, and thus, uh, he saw a philosophical and ethical uh, justification for his uh, political agenda. And uh, this is uh, exactly uh, the topic of uh, our panel, uh, which is uh, going uh, to be further elaborated by our magnificent uh, speakers. Uh, first, uh, Professor Dariusz Juruś, philosopher from Jagiellonian University. Uh, please, Professor, come to us. Uh, Dr. Jakub Bożydar Wiśniewski, uh, also philosopher and uh, economist. And uh, Father Jacek uh, Gniadek, a missionary and uh, moral uh, theologist, please. <laughs> All uh, the speakers uh, are authors uh, of uh, the numerous uh, articles, uh, papers, uh, and, and books uh, on libertarianism and uh, Austrian uh, economics. Um, I guess uh, that uh, their speeches uh, will be, will be uh, very helpful uh, when it uh, comes down to understanding uh, Mises' uh, philosophical uh, legacy. Uh, and uh, as for uh, the rules uh, of uh, our uh, debate, uh, as far as I know, uh, we have uh, 70 minutes uh, at our uh, disposal. Uh, so uh, we are going uh, to start uh, with uh, three 10 minutes uh, speeches, then we're uh, going to have uh, 10 minutes uh, responses, and uh, at the end uh, there will be time for you, time uh, for questions uh, from the audience. Uh, and uh, we are going to start uh, with uh, Professor Juroš. And thank you very much for the invitation for this conference and this anniversary. And I am going to talk about, firstly, about meta-ethical positions of Mises. Why? Because, first of all, I think that this is less known, this meta-ethical position of Mises. And the secondly, which is also very important, I think, it's a more controversial, according to me, at least. So, before I start to present Mises' position as regards meta-ethical uh, questions, I will make a short introduction as regards metaethics. So when we speak about metaethics, we speak generally about analytical ethics or about the language of ethics. So when we speak about metaethics, we have to, we can have two general positions in metaethics. The first position is called cognitivism, and the second one is called non-cognitivism. So what are the differences between cognitivism and non-cognitivism? So there are fundamental, there are fundamental differences between cognitivists and non-cognitivists. 
So the first difference is that cognitivists claim that there is something as objective reality to which ethical judgment, judgments refer. So ethical judgments, in a sense, are descriptive because they describe something, and therefore ethical judgments can be true or false. So there is distinction between two positions in cognitivism, namely between so-called intuitionists and naturalists. What do intuitionists claim? They claim that the, there is a feature which is described by ethical judgments, and this feature is non-natural. There is non-natural feature which is described when somebody utter ethical judgments. And that non-natural feature is apprehended, according to intuitionists, by intuition. That's something which but by other people are called something mystical. What do naturalists claim? They claim, they agree with intuitionists, that there is, in fact, particular feature which is described by ethical judgments by they don't agree with intuitionists as regard the nature of this feature and they claim that that feature is natural feature. So in other words, we can in a hand apprehend this feature using scientific methods, psychology, anthropology or, or sociology. So there is a difference between intuitionists and naturalists. In opposition to cognitivists, there are non-cognitivists. What do they claim? They claim that there is no such a thing as objective reality to which ethical terms, ethical judgments refer to. So it means that the meaning of ethical terms or ethical judgments is only expressive meaning, expressive meaning. So the only role of ethical terms, only function of ethical terms and judgments, or the only meanings or the main meanings, meaning of ethical judgments is expressive meaning, is expressive meaning, or evocative meaning, or evocative meaning. Therefore, there is a further uh, conclusion, there is no such a thing in ethics as, as true or falsity. Because when we speak about our expressions, we cannot say that our expressions are true or false. When I am shouting hurrah, I express myself and I cannot say that it was something true or false. So there is a fundamental difference between cognitivist and non-cognitivist. And for example, when, to give an example as a function of this, these, two, these two positions, when I am saying that man is a good person, according to intuitionists, I am describing non-natural feature of that person which I comprehend by intuition. According to naturalists, when I say that that man is a good person, I'm also describing a feature of that man, but which is natural. In a sense, I can know what is this particular feature using methods of sociology, psychology, anthropology, and so on and so forth. But when I'm saying that is a good person, when, when I am a motivist, I only express my attitudes toward that person. In that case, positive attitude toward this person. So therefore, I cannot say that my utterance was true or false. So where is Mrs. in this spectrum? So Mrs. is on the non-cognitivist part. I will quote a fragment from Mrs when he clearly declares this position. Propositions asserting existence, affirmative existential propositions, or non-existence, negative existential propositions are descriptive. 
they assert something about the state of the whole universe or part of the universe. With regard to them, questions of truth and falsity are significant. They must not be confounded with judgment of value. Judgments of value are voluntaristic. They express feelings, tests, or preferences of the individual who utters them. With regard to them, there cannot be any questions of truth and falsity. They are ultimate and not subject to any proof or evidence. So what is the consequence of such a standpoint of, of, of misses? The first consequence is, is that all ethical judgments, all, va all value judgments are personal and subjective, as Mrs. says, personally subjective. And the other consequence is that there is no objective standard or criterion according to which we can assess whether particular judgment was true or false. So we cannot assess as regards the value judgments which concerns ultimate ends. We can, of course, as perhaps my colleagues will be talking about, we can also assess only means or measures to particular, to particular ends. And what is the last consequences of the Mrs. standpoint? That if there is no truth and falsity as regards the realm of ethics, there is a split between the realm of facts and realm of values. So there is no transition, according to Mrs., from the factual judgments to value judgments. So in other words, we cannot derive any value judgments from any factual judgments. So it, it is very important to say that because when we go further into consequences of Mrs. position, we can say that actually it is not possible to argue in ethics because if there is no truth on falsity when we speak about value judgment, there is no point to discuss, to argue, to persuade people as regards ethics. So that's my first part of my uh, speech. Thank you very much, and I take the floor to other colleagues. Thank you. Uh, now, Dr. Wisniewski, the microphone is yours. Uh, okay, so uh, the main thesis that I would like to put forward is that uh, the main contribution of Mises to sound ethical reflection, even if it is only an implicit, not an explicit uh, suggestion, is that value freedom does not imply value irrelevance. So what do we mean by that? Uh, uh, of course, Mrs. is known to be an adamant supporter of value freedom. He has been an intransigent defender of the notion that economics is a value-free science, a value-free value -free scholarly discipline, which means that uh, it is not necessarily implicated in any specific ethical system. And of course, Mises was so adamant about stressing the value freedom of economics, primarily in order to combat uh, Marxism, which suggested that economics is essentially, or so-called classical economics, or neoclassical economics, or Austrian economics, because all of those, uh, mm, shall we say, classical and classically inspired strands of economics were understood by Marxists to be an expression of interests, political interests of a specific social group. And Mises was adamant in denying that notion. Uh, he insisted that economics has a very strict logical structure, that economics is essentially an application of logic to the analysis of human action in order to refute the notion that, uh, that as I said, that uh, accepting certain economic propositions uh, necessarily implies that we are committed to certain value judgments. 
He said, no, economics applies to every social group, every society, every environment in which human action takes place. So it is definitely not the case that uh, economics is, uh, or for instance, Austrian economics, the kind of economics that, uh, the, the kind of tradition that Mises belongs to, is a tradition which serves as a kind of underhanded endorsement of the interests of capitalists or entrepreneurs or property owners and so on. And this insistence on uh, the logical necessity <laughs> of economic theorems and on the logically deductive structure of uh, um, economic reasoning was his primary tool of arguing for that conclusion. So that's what Mises meant by value freedom. And I said at the outset that value freedom does not imply value irrelevance. In other words, even though economics is value free, even though by doing economics we are not committed to making any ethical judgments or ethical statements, it nonetheless does not imply that economics is unimportant or uninteresting or irrelevant to uh, economic reasoning. And of course, uh, as has been mentioned, uh, as my colleague mentioned uh, a moment ago, uh, Mises himself was uh, uh, an ethical subjectivist. So uh, he didn't think that there is any parallel uh, logical objective structure to be discovered in ethics, similar to the one that he insisted can be discovered in economics. Uh, but fortunately, we do not have to agree with Mises uh, in order to um, find economics, especially in the Austrian tradition, as uh, a discipline which is very important uh, in the context of doing sound ethical theory. So. Uh, it is precisely uh, due to the fact that economics is value-free that, I would argue, it is applicable to all kinds of uh, ethical traditions and, in an important sense, circumscribes those ethical traditions. Uh, it, uh, makes, uh, uh, it makes us realize that there are certain non-negotiable constraints and parameters, logically necessary constraints, that have to be taken into account whenever we propose certain ethical goals. Whenever we say that certain things are desirable, we have to take into account whether those supposedly desirable goals are viable, whether they are achievable. And it is precisely by studying economics that we can find out whether uh, such goals are achievable or not. And this applies to all ethical traditions, all across the board. So for example, if we are utilitarians, but utilitarians of a more thick, let us say, or of a more materialistic variety than the utilitarianism of Mises, and we suggest, for example, that it is ethically, uh, it is an ethically laudable and desirable goal to maximize uh, the physical productivity of the economy, we have to bear in mind that uh, in order to be able to implement those ethical goals, we have to have a sound and comprehensive knowledge of economics, because otherwise uh, our efforts to do something that we consider to be ethically desirable from the utilitarian st standpoint, for example, in this context, will be uh, counter-effective. Uh, it is precisely by studying economics that we can uh, that we can understand, that we can comprehend the fact that there are certain necessary logical and praxeological and institutional preconditions that have to be met if the physical productivity of the economy is to be maximized. So for example, uh, what we need in order to uh, obtain this kind of maximization is uh, specialization, division of labor, capital accumulation, uh, innovation, and entrepreneurship. And those phenomena in turn require uh, a certain degree of respect for uh, the institutions of private property, uh, pri private uh, property exchange, sound money, uh, uh, legal stability, and so on and so forth. So in this sense, economics is very relevant to ethical considerations. 
Or, uh, to take another example, let us assume that we are not utilitarians, but deontologists of a certain kind, socialist deontologists, for example. And we believe that it is a duty of every right-thinking individual to contribute to the creation of a functional socialist economy, because only a socialist economy uh, can fulfill the noble ethical obje objective of uh, taking from everyone according to his abilities and giving to everyone according to his needs. And again, uh, our ethical reasoning will be futile or worse if we do not take economics into consideration. The, 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 mo the, the most fundamental principle of every sound deontology says that ought implies can. In other words, if we believe that something should be done, if we believe that something ought to be done, then we have to make sure that it can, in fact, be done, that it is logically possible to do it. And again, if we apply uh, the Misesian theorem of the impossibility of uh, economic calculation under socialism to this particular kind of ethical reasoning, then we can come to the conclusion that it cannot be a duty of anyone to try to implement a well-functioning socialist economy because there is no such thing, there can be no such thing as a rationally functioning socialist economy. That there are praxeological uh, necessary uh, reasons why such an institutional structure is bound to frustrate any attempts at uh, maximizing social utility or, or uh, maximizing, let us say, ethical praiseworthiness by giving from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. Because in such a system, uh, there, there can be no sound uh, uh, cost accounting, there can, be no, uh, mm, there can be no intellectual division of labor which allows us to figure out in the first place which needs are particularly pressing and which abilities are particularly uh, effective and uh, particularly capable of being monetized and so on. So again, in this context, we see that economic reasoning is uh, crucial if we are to engage in sound ethical reasoning. And this is, the, this is the case precisely on account of the value-free character of economics. If economics were not value-free, then it wouldn't be, it couldn't be value-relevant all across the board. And I think that the general uh, conclusion that we can draw from uh, the Misesian tradition is that various value-free social sciences, particularly those of so-called nomothetic character, uh, that is, especially those social sciences whose aim is to establish the existence of certain logically necessary laws applying to the realm of human action, are uh, essential or have to be taken into account in a crucial manner whenever we propose any ethical proposals, whenever we make any uh, normative statements that we consider to be implementable, that we consider to be actionable. And uh, we typically understand this point in the context of uh, natural sciences. For example, nobody in his right mind would say that we should create a perpetual motion machine because creating a perpetual motion machine would enable us to contribute towards the noble ethical goal of eliminating world hunger because there is no such thing as a perpetual motion machine. There cannot be such a thing as a perpetual motion machine and physics explains why there cannot be, uh, there cannot be such a thing. And in this sense, a value-free discipline, which is acknowledged as such by practically everyone, uh, is highly value-relevant. And I believe that uh, mm, we can reach a similar conclusion regarding social sciences, and it is particularly the Misesian paradigm, both when it comes to norm, uh, so, uh, applied economics and when it comes to his economic methodology that allow us to realize that there is this kind of parallel here be between physical sciences or natural sciences and uh, social sciences. In other words, social sciences, first of all, are value-free, or at least should aspire to be value-free, and secondly, it is only in, on account of them being value-free that they can be value-relevant in a crucial sense. And as such, uh, it is imperative to take them into account uh, whenever we engage in any kind of ethical reasoning that, uh, that aspires to be practicable, that aspires to be implementable. So in this sense, there is a very uh, essential complementarity between uh, normative social theory or ethics in general and value-free social sciences. And, then, and I believe that we owe it to Mises and to the Misesian paradigm that we can fully grasp this.
point. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. And the last uh, speaker, Father Dr. Gniadek. Thank you very much. It's working. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I always um, uh, find myself uh, between a uh, rock and hard place uh, when I have to speak about Mises. Because on the one hand, um, I have always, you see, Catholics uh, who uh, criticize me, but they have never read uh, the human action. On the other hand, I have, you see, you know, um, you who are who follow the Austrian school of economics, but uh, you are not a theologian. Uh, so my position is always, you see, you know, a little difficult uh, to talk about Mises. And uh, I'm a moral theologian, and I'm a priest. Uh, even talking even now, you see, I cannot you see hide myself. I wear a Roman collar, so already you see, I would say, you see, I on the on the one hand, I I promote advocate. Uh, uh, idea of the liberty that uh, is explained by the Mises, uh, uh, as I find in human action. And uh, on the other hand, you see, you know, I point out uh, at the ultimate goal because uh, uh, that I had chosen. And that's, I think, is the problem. I don't want you to uh, to uh, uh, to put uh, out on you, you see, the ultimate goal that I had chosen, you see, but uh, uh, I cannot uh, speak, you see, as a just a lecturer. I speak and as a missionary. What I do, you see, you know, with Mises, you see, I don't only, you see, you know, I, I uh, the Mises Institute was founded 15 years ago, and that I started reading Mises uh, 30 years ago, and uh, I would like, you see, to tell you what uh, I had been attracted by uh, in uh, what Mises says, uh, because uh, I think that is, uh, mm, that it. Uh, might help you to understand my position as a Roman Catholic priest who, uh, mm, who uh, since many years uh, had been uh, advocating, you see, this uh, idea of uh, liberty, as I find. So I would like to point out that, uh, two points uh, that I think that are important uh, for this topic. This is the Mises uh, utilitarianism, uh, and uh, uh, the second thing is the principle of uh, um, world Freiheit, because this, uh, for the first part of my speech, I would like you see, you know, to start from that. Uh, this uh, Mises, uh, Mises utilitarianism uh, is based uh, on a logic of uh, causal effectual rationalis, uh, relations that is uh, nothing new in the development of economic thought. It was already St. Thomas Aquinas and the late scholastic who used uh, utilitarian arguments to prove natural economic order. Even you see, you know, it's very often we, uh, in the social teaching of the church, we say that um, the beginning of this uh, um, social teaching of the church begins with, the, with uh, Leon the Great, uh, with his ethical letter, Rerum Novarum, but uh, it is, uh, I would say, from the very beginning already Clement of Alexandria. Uh, who mm, wrote, who explained that uh, goods, the, uh, the commodities that we find on the, uh, on the market, they have no values uh, in itself. You see that uh, we, uh, we give them value. So there was a already Clement of uh, Alexandria later after uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, we have uh, late sc scholastics who used this utilitarian argument uh, to prove the natural economic order. So for them, the value of commodity of service resides not uh, so much in their objective value, but in uh, how people value them at the moment of exchange. So the, this means that the economic value is a result of individual preferences. Uh, in the ultimate account, it's always a subjective. And uh, Mises' rational utilitarianism um, does not mean, however, that man aims only at the satisfaction of his material needs. And he is, uh, for him, the ultimate criterion for the evaluation of his action. Mises um, points out um, that um, the goal that um, the mm, person, uh, uh, the free person might choose uh, uh, might have a, a metaphysical character. So that means uh, it might be, you see, you know, the, might, be, uh, might be God himself. And it doesn't, you see, you know, uh, Disturb us, you see, you know, to, uh, mm, mm, uh, you see, uh, mm, 
Maple Street, you see, you know, the economic uh, life. So metallurgical, uh, uh, and this is uh, something that I, will add, uh, I wanted to point out, uh, that this is uh, the, mm, uh, that, uh, this, uh, that uh, the person, the free person, and uh, that aims and not only aims at the satisfaction of uh, his material needs, uh, what is stressed uh, by, by Mises. Uh, however, methodological individualism and subjective uh, and the sub subjective theory of value uh, does not allow uh, do not allow us uh, to reduce um, uh, our thinking about man uh, to the category of a homo economicus. And the concept of uh, negative uh, freedom does not reduce uh, man uh, merely to creative transcendence, uh, but uh, permits him to develop uh, receptive transcendence, open to the truth. So Mises' anthropological assumption, and there's something that uh, uh, from the very beginning when I started, uh, when I read for the first time Human Action, uh, this, uh, th th these are the first uh, uh, 200 pages uh, where uh, Mises uh, develops, you see, the, his uh, anthropological uh, assumptions uh, and by means of the, of the uh, psychology uh, approach. So uh, Mises' anthropological assumptions uh, allow us to presume that each man's potential action in uh, Luciferism can be morally good act. So that's something that is uh, important for me as a moral theologian, what I discovered and I've been advocating that uh, the Luciferism, the Lucifer uh, system allows us, you see, you know, the, it gives us the freedom, the, the, the room in which we can, uh, um, uh, every, every potentially, you see, act might be a, a, a morally good act. So man in a Mises um, is free to aim at his goal and uh, that the goal that uh, he chooses freely. And uh, morality consists, and this is something that, uh, because I, talk, I, 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 I talk as a moral theologian, so morality consists in the rational ordering of the human act to the good in its truth and the voluntary pursuit of the good known by reason. So we can see that morality involves, you see, you know, the free will, the reason, and uh, uh, the, the goal that it might be, you see, the, for me, uh, as I said at the beginning, is the ultimate goal. But there, uh, uh, Mises doesn't, you see, describe, doesn't, you see, say what is uh, my goal. I really choose, you see, the goal uh, that um, uh, is, the, uh, is my, uh, my ultimate goal uh, uh, of, of my life. So this is the uh, Mises utilitarianism that uh, uh, is uh, explained, you see, you know, uh, by him. And uh, I don't see any problem as a moral theologian with that, uh, because uh, when it is combined with the uh, subjective theory of value uh, and with the methodological individualism. And the second uh, thing that I would like is, you know, to point out, uh, this is the principle of Wert uh, mm, uh, Freiheit. This is the science uh, free in from valuation, and it was uh, for me this the central point of his uh, praxeological system. When I uh, read for the first time the human action that was uh, I was attracted by in the first 200 pages that uh, what uh, were you see Mises uh, puts you see his uh, anthropological uh, assumptions, and he says uh, who uh, who man uh, who the acting man uh, what the human action is about. So according to him, the postulate of Wert uh, uh, Freiheit may be easily uh, uh, fulfilled in praxeology because uh, it is also applied, praxeology is also applied uh, in other a priori sciences. It's not only that uh, it's reduced only, or we use only it uh, for the uh, economics. So Mrs. calls praxeology uh, an apolitical science and uh, uh, when I uh, advocate and when I mm, promote, you see, the Austrian School of Economics as a, as a, uh, as a priest, a moral theologian, I don't intend to make uh, uh, out of uh, the Austrian School of Economics, uh, I don't even try uh, to do that, uh, to make and to think in, the t in terms of, uh, let's say, that uh, it could be good, you see, to, to, uh, to, to create uh, something like a Christian, uh, Christian economics. I don't want, I want, you see, the economics to be uh, as uh, to, to follow this principle of uh, uh, Wertfreiheit, because uh, 
uh, this is, should be neutral, as Mises as says. It, in, uh, it is in all respects neutral, for it refers only to the means uh, and not to the choice of the ultimate goal. And praxeology uh, uh, is a domain of uh, scientific research that deals with uh, uh, any purposeful human action. And uh, as an example, a good example, I would like to see to point out at the no, uh, personalistic norm mm, uh, described by uh, Karol Wojtyła, later John Paul II, uh, in his book, uh, um, Love and Re Responsibility. And John Paul uh, says, and uh, of course, what, uh, what, the, uh, what we have in the church, we have the commandment of love, but we, uh, by uh, using you see, the, the principle of uh, negative uh, uh, freedom, we might, and the praxeology, we might develop, you see what he did, uh, the personalistic norm, which states that the human person is the kind of good that does not admit of misuse and cannot be treated as an object of use as a such a, a means to an end. Uh, so it shows, you see, you know, that this example that uh, the praxeology doesn't, it's not, it's not, not, not uh, only limited, you see, to, uh, to the economics uh, we may use in, uh, for other sciences, uh, or even in the, uh, in the, in, in the theology and the ethics. And uh, uh, the praxeology is uh, always neutral because uh, uh, it refers only to the means and not to the choice of the ultimate goal. And that's something you see why I'm attracted by, I have been attracted by, by this uh, Austrian School of Economics as a theologian, as a, uh, as a, as a missionary, as a, as a priest, uh, because you see Mises doesn't, uh, doesn't say what is, is uh, he says one thing that uh, uh, every, every human being chooses, you see, you know, a goal and that wants you see to achieve. Uh, and uh, this uh, he applies to the economics uh, uh, because uh, to mm, give value to uh, the commodities that we have on the market, uh, we have to have a goal. And the goal is not uh, defined by him, and that's something that we have to, uh, as a free human beings, we, uh, we, we have, you see, you know, uh, this um, room given by, mm, by the praxeology, by this idea of, uh, of the free market that uh, mm, is promoted by uh, Mises. And so uh, we, ha we uh, can choose uh, freely, and uh, it doesn't matter, you see, I'm uh, Catholic, I'm Protestant, I'm ag agnostic, or, or I'm searching for the truth. So for everybody, it's a uh, mm, place, it's a room uh, in the world that uh, uh, follows, you see, the, uh, this principle of, uh, um, mm, of, a free market, of, of a free market that uh, implies the word uh, Freiheit. Uh, so that's, uh, this is a science that is free from valuation. And uh, uh, so this, these are the two points I wanted you, see, you know, to point out uh, that are, I find interesting in Mises' uh, writings uh, for this topic. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, now we are going to the second part of uh, our discussion, starting uh, again uh, from Professor Jursch. Thank you very much. Uh, I will stick to these ethical uh, questions and ethical issues, and I will appear as an advocate of diaboli, perhaps, but I make some remarks about the Mrs. approach to doctrine of natural law, because I think that Mrs. is, in a sense, incoherent as regards his approach to the doctrine of natural law. Because, on the one hand, Mrs says that the idea of natural law led eventually to rationalism and utilitarianism. It's a quotation from this theory and, and history. So it means that according to Mrs., uh, the doctrine of natural law is a source of utilitarianism. So leaving aside the question if is so, because I think it's not the case. So. In the human action, Mrs. says that by the teachings of utilitarian philosophy and classical economics have nothing at all to do with the doctrine of natural law. So I think that, that therefore I said that Mrs. is in a sense incoherent as regards his, his approach to the doctrine of natural law. 
And what else? And sometimes Mrs. claims that there is something a social uh, social cooperation, you say, which is natural phenomenon. And this social cooperation is, as Mrs. says, in conformity with human nature. So if this is, if this is so, so we must assume that Mrs. assumes that there is something as human nature. And the question, very simple question is, what is the human nature? Is it something objective or maybe is it something relative? And when Mrs. refers to the doctrine of human nature, he writes as follows. There is the first idea that the nature given order of things exists to which man must adjust his action if he wants to succeed. So it seems that according to Mrs., the gap between factual judgments and value judgments in this case disappears because when we replace the word must by word should, we have the doctrine actually of natural law that from factual statements, from factual judgments, we can derive factual, uh, so sorry, value, value uh, judgments. So, but according to Mrs., of course, this statement says nothing about ultimate ends, but about means to the ends, because there's kind of hypothetical imperative in this sentence, because Mrs. says, if he wants to succeed. If he doesn't want to succeed, he needn't. He doesn't need to, to, to conform to, to this natural, natural, natural order. And for Mrs. it's of course obvious that the science of, of, of economics or ethics should be value free so that we cannot, we, we cannot assess any ultimate, ultimate ends. And he writes as follows. It's neither more nor less rational to aim at riches like Croesus than to aim at poverty like a Buddhist monk. So in other words, we cannot say that is something rational to be rich or is something irrational to be rich. But it's a relatively safe example. But when we replace, for example, this uh, riches by committing suicide, and we can say that it is neither more nor less rational to commit suicide than not to commit suicide. It's a different story. And I think that should be uh, any method in ethics to argue that, for example, as in, as, as in Kant, for example, that committing suicide is something irrational. According to Mises, it seems that in the sphere of ethics, I'm confining to, to the sphere of ethics, I'm not talking about economics, but in the sphere of ethics, we are lost in a sense. That but because we cannot argue that something is rational and something is irrational. Everything is on the same level. And the last consequences of this Mrs. approach to ethics, because I have said I am confining it to, to, the, to the ethics, is that there is a split in the human nature. Because as Mrs. is concerned, Mrs. claims that there is a realm of factual judgments, which could be true or false, and there is a realm of value judgments, which cannot be true or false. The factual judgments are rational, and value judgments are emotional. So in other words, we have the human beings, which are split into two separate parts, rational parts and emotional parts. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, so uh, perhaps uh, I might uh, carry on this uh, subject of uh, Mises uh, versus uh, the question of uh, ethical objectivity and the question of uh, natural law. I, I also believe that uh, uh, Mises uh, makes an uh, unnecessary um, concession to uh, ethical subjectivism. He makes an unnecessary transition from uh, economic subjectivism to uh, ethical subjectivism, uh, precisely due to the fact that uh, his recognition of the fact that uh, ethical, uh, sorry, economic values are uh, subjective is paired and inextricably linked with his parallel recognition that uh, economic laws are not subjective, they are objective. So uh, the whole area of praxeology deals with uh, the task of uh, accomplishing one's subjective goals within the framework of certain objective laws which have to be respected if this task is to be accomplished. And the more respectful we are of those objective economic laws, which we have to discover in the first place, the more we are capable of actualizing our subjective economic goals. And uh, this uh, observation, which lies at the very foundation of the Misesian paradigm, is coupled with uh, the fact that, uh, again, as my colleague mentioned a moment ago, there is in fact such a thing as uh, objective human nature, and which is a point that is repeatedly stressed by uh, Mises in uh, the methodological part, parts of his uh, writings. He uh, consistently and repeatedly points out that uh, uh, human beings are categorically and qualitatively different from uh, the rest of the uh, material world, that uh, unlike uh, plants, we are not governed by stimuli, and unlike uh, animals, we are not governed by instinct, or at least not purely by instincts, we can uh, counter them. And uh, uh, the fundamental uh, mode of uh, behavior that is uh, characteristic of human beings is action. And action is volition, will, transformed into agency. In other words, it's a prototypically teleological, intentional, goal-driven, goal-oriented kind of uh, behavior. And uh, that by itself implies that uh, certain uh, objective logical conditions have to be met if this human goal orientedness is to be able to fulfill its full potential. So uh, we might agree with Mises that it's a, it's a tall order to establish that there exists some uh, uh, universally agreeable or objective ethical goals that should be aimed at, substantive goals, but still it, it implies that there exists a certain uh, objective ethical rights and uh, uh, side constraints, to use the Nozikian language, that have to be respected if human action is to be able to flourish. And if social cooperation is to, uh, is to emerge and assume its ever more advanced qualitative forms. Uh, as some of you might know, uh, Mises intended to uh, name his magnum opus, which uh, Finally, uh, which was finally published under the name Human Action. Uh, the original name was Social Cooperation. So in Mises's view, human action and social cooperation are inextricably bound. It might be said that the natural end of human action is social cooperation. That's, the unique, uh, that's a unique phenomenon that can emerge exclusively in the context of interhuman relations. And it stands to reason to suggest that by engaging in social cooperation, which is the natural goal of human action, human beings are capable of flourishing. That is, they are capable of fulfilling their potential. They are capable of elevating their intrinsic nature to the most uh, highly developed qualitative state. And uh, 
In fact, uh, uh, Mises is quite, uh, I, would, I would argue that he is quite insistent on this point uh, whenever he, uh, especially when he enters into a kind of a polemical tone, when he, when he engages in, uh, uh, in an exchange, in an argumentative exchange with his opponents, for example, with those who criticize uh, the Misesian paradigm in uh, economics or who criticize free economy, entrepreneurial economy in general by suggesting that, it's, uh, that it uh, is bound to degenerate into some sort of uh, social Darwinism. And for example, Mises does not dispute that. He says, yes, I agree with that and I support that. But uh, if you define social Darwinism as the survival of the fittest, then you have to be realized that being fit, fittedness in the human context does not mean engaging in a kind of eliminative competition whereby the physically stronger eliminate the physically weaker, but fitness in the context of human affairs pertains precisely to human ability of engaging in social cooperation, of achieving in a joint fashion the kind of complex goals that would be unattainable uh, in the context of uh, self-sufficient activity, let alone in the kind of activity that, that is not driven by, uh, by intentional uh, and uh, uh, purposively thought out goals. Right? In, and in this sense, uh, uh, human interaction is, uh, uh, and human fitness in the context of uh, um, human interactions uh, is uh, something uh, qualitatively distinct, in fact, very much distinct from the kind of competition that we observe in the world of nature. Uh, in addition, uh, in the context of uh, human affairs, in fact, competition turns out to be the subtlest form of cooperation. That is what uh, the Misesian, uh, uh, the Misesian uh, theorem of economic calculation teaches us, and that's what the Hayekian notion of spontaneous order teaches us. So I believe that uh, uh, Mises displays at many points an implicit sympathy for some kind of conception of natural law uh, which is hidden implicitly in the Misesian paradigm and it is hidden implicitly in this uh, conception of uh, praxeology as rooted in a very specific substantive conception of human nature. It is only when Mises discusses ethics implicitly that he reverts to his ethical subjectivism, uh, even though, as I argue, uh, there, are, uh, there are some nascent uh, elements of, of, of a teleological uh, concept of uh, human flourishing uh, hidden within the praxeological paradigm, which has been uh, very aptly developed by his uh, greatest disciple, Murray Rothbard. Thank you. And again, the last speaker, Father Dr. Gniadek. I like what Mr. says you see at the end of uh, his uh, uh, human action. Uh, that's what you quoted, you see, you know, yeah, that, uh, that the, is, uh, the, the, goal, the, the goal of the Lestitarism uh, at, uh, is not, you see, you know, to become rich, uh, to multiply, you see, you know, the uh, goods. Uh, the goal of is to be free, to, uh, to, to have a freedom of, uh, of choice. And uh, Mises says, you see, you know, the desire uh, to be uh, rich is not more or less rational than the desire to become poor as a Buddhist monk. And uh, Mises, uh, as I understand you see Mises, uh, he says uh, what is rational, rational is uh, what I uh, achieve uh, because uh, I had uh, uh, chosen, you see, you know, a uh, goal and I have achieved it. Yeah, it's a function From, of oh, yes. Mm -hmm. yes, I agree to it. Yeah, so that's something you see, you know, and uh, uh, to continue, you see, you know, what I uh, wanted to say, you see, in my first part of my, of my speech about uh, uh, the subjective fear of value, you see, you know, I would like to refer to that once again, uh, because uh, the, subjective, uh, mm, su the subjectivity understood in this way, as we have uh, uh, in human action, uh, should be distinguished from ethical subjectivism, which claims that moral truth is subjective and constitutes the product of personal awareness. 
So the Ostian, so the Mises, uh, claims that man is uh, in action, is uh, guided by his own scale of values. And that's not, not something you see, you know, as I experience, uh, because what I, would, what I would say, I put in practice, you see, what uh, he, Mises teaches about that. You see, I, uh, when I read for the first time, you see, you know, about uh, this idea of, uh, the, of uh, the scale of value, I discovered in, my, uh, uh, in myself that I do it every day, not only once, uh, forever, that I, I had chosen, you see, a goal, and I uh, pursue, you see, you know, for, uh, for this goal, but what I do, you see, every day, every day, you see, the scale of value changes. Of course, you see, as, as I said, you see, for, for me, the ultimate goal is God himself. Uh, he is on top, but uh, I would say he is not always on top. Sometimes I put, you see, on top something uh, different. And uh, mm, uh, Mises says that the, hum the, uh, the human person, the, hu the hu human person, Mises says he what, uh, Mises uh, always, uh, he never says uh, the human person, he always says individual. But uh, what means as an individual, I, I put, you see, the human person, and I, 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 I discovered, I see, you see, there is no, no difference for me. So this, um, the goals of human action are subjective, and uh, that is why every human being has to designate them. You see, you know that the goal is up to me, you see, to choose, and this is subjective. Is it rational or not? As I said, you see before, and this, if I achieve the goal that I had chosen, this is uh, my way is, uh, of uh, uh, pursuing this goal is, uh, is, uh, uh, is rational. And what Mises says, that uh, there is uh, nobody from outside who may come and to judge and to tell you this is rational or not, because the person who is from outside doesn't know your goal. And... Uh, mm, uh, I would like, you know, to refer, uh, talking about the subjective theory of value, to uh, once again to John Paul II and to his encyclical letter, uh, Veritatis Splendor. So John Paul uh, John Paul shows that uh, the ethics of personalism, based on subjectivity, does not weaken human action in accord with the objective truth. So, uh, in uh, uh, his encyclical letter, John Paul uh, mm, explains that moral action is good not only when the subject of action corresponds with uh, the true good of a person, which is the ultimate goal and uh, uh, the highest good of man, that is God himself, but there is a second part uh, for an actor to be a morally good, that uh, when the person through his deeds in a free manner shapes himself and takes on the form he desires. So there are two things that are involved. On the one hand, we have, you see, the truth, and uh, God himself, the, I would say the Ten Commandments, what uh, you see in the book of Deuteronomy, we, uh, we read, you see God, uh, he says, see, I have set before you today life and good, uh, death and evil, and you choose. You choose either to follow me or not to follow me, uh, to, uh, to take this uh, way of uh, my commandments, or you uh, deny and you uh, just, you see, you know, pick up your own way and uh, that will lead you to uh, death. So that is something, uh, you see, you know, that uh, a good, um, uh, a good uh, uh, moral action is good when uh, it involves, you see, on the one hand, uh, we have a, a goal that we choose, um, that we free, are free to choose in that sense, will be morally uh, good uh, from uh, the point of uh, of the teaching of the church, when this is the, uh, the this is God Himself, the Ten Commandments, and uh, that we follow. And on the other hand, uh, God doesn't force us uh, to do it. We have to discover that this is my uh, roadmap that I uh, this uh, that is uh, I agree with God <coughs> that this is uh, what I want to do myself uh, for my salvation, for achieving the goal that uh, I have freely chosen. So man's creativity and his freedom are not expressed in finding a law, uh, but uh, in a living through the law written in his heart, uh, uh, that is, uh, in his conscience. Uh, and when the, uh, where, where the bond between man's freedom and God's uh, law is a, a living uh, seed. So at, uh, what we see, what I, how I, how I, I, I understand uh, Mises, uh, so Mises, uh, 
uh, Mrs. Man, is a Mrs. Uh, uh, human person, individual, is guided by his own scale of value and builds it up on the basis of a goal he freely chose. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you for your attention.